Uh, my name is Maggie Dalman, uh, and I'm Dean in the Faculty of Natural Sciences. And I am actually extremely pleased and proud of the fantastic research and educational effort that we have into the environmental challenges. And this has both great breadth and depth. And this evening's event is actually co-hosted by two of our um, major activities in this area. So first of all, the grand challenges in ecosystems and the environment, and secondly, the Grantham Institute. And I'm delighted that we've got all of the directors here this evening, E.J. milner Gulland from the Grand Challenges in Ecosystems and the Environment, and Joe Haig, who you'll be hearing from later on, and Martin Siegert, who are the co-directors of the Grantham Institute. Um, in the Grand Challenges in the Ecosystems and the Environment activity, uh, Silwood Park actually acts I'm really proud to say this as a global hub of our activities uh, to, to address these challenges. And indeed, our speaker this evening is part of that global activity who's flown over from California just at the weekend to be with us here this evening. And he'll be spending some time uh, at Silwood, and you'll hear a bit more about what he's planning to do, I hope, this evening. So EJ is going to be taking over later on to compare the event and, and talk us through things. Um, the Grantham Institute is based in South Kensington, and it reaches across into all of the faculties and also uh, to other institutions, also globally, to bring together strengths from across the different disciplines to bear on these enormous challenges that we face in uh, environmental change. So the oceans, the subject of tonight's debate. Well, I'm just an immunologist, but even to me, it's so obvious that the oceans are one of our greatest assets on the planet. But I guess we don't always treat them with the respect that we need to. And through the work of people like Ben and others that I can see in the audience, as Tina up there, we're beginning to understand the challenges that the oceans face and hopefully, hopefully through that understanding, we'll be able to address the problems that otherwise would have a very serious effect uh, on, on the planet. So I'm really pleased that we've got such a fantastic audience here tonight, and I think it just shows um, how important uh, this particular challenge of oceans research is and is to us. So EJ, I'll hand over to you now. <coughs> Hello, welcome everybody. It's very exciting to see you all here. So I'm the director of the Grand Challenges in Ecosystems and Environment Initiative and I'll be comparing later. So I'm hoping that you're all going to be thinking of really difficult questions for the panel's discussion later. So our keynote speaker is Ben Halpern. Um, I'm very excited that he's here, particularly as this is marking his uh, beginning of a tenure as a 20% professor at Imperial College. And um, Ben's going to be one of our... Um, exciting international um, co-funded professors that um, give us kind of international reach so that we're able to collaborate through them with a wide range of people worldwide. So Ben, as well as being a professor here, is also um, professor of marine biology and conservation at the University of California in Santa Barbara and director of the National Center for Ecological, uh, uh, an associate of the National Center of Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, um, also in California and Director of the Centre for Marine Assessment and Planning. He's also a Senior Fellow here at UNEP WCMC, so he's, um, he's certainly a busy guy, and we're really grateful that he can come. So thank you very much, Ben. Thanks, everyone, for uh, coming. It's really a great honour to be here and to mark this inaugural uh, day of my time here at Imperial. It's, it's a great way to start and I'm really excited to show you some of the work we've been doing to try to um, measure and therefore better manage this idea of ocean health, what it means to have a healthy ocean. Um, my, my family's association or relationship with the ocean stretches a very, very long time back. Uh, my grandfather, 17 or 18 generations, back was actually one of the original people on Nantucket Island, which is a small island off the coast of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. Uh, the oldest house on the island is actually my family's house there. His name was Nathaniel Paddock. And uh, this was in the mid to late 1600s. 
And uh, his brother, Ichabod Paddock, lived across the Sound on Cape Cod and had discovered uh, this new way of whaling, shore-based whaling, that was particularly effective and efficient. And Nathaniel decided to invite Ichabod over to Nantucket to introduce this new technique to the island. And as uh, one historian noted, he must have been a very good teacher. Because if you know the history of whaling uh, globally, Nantucket, after that, became the global epicenter of whaling for 100 years, leading to, um, well, the near extinction of many, many whaling species, uh, whale species. So I, I didn't know this story until later in my career, but I feel like it sort of uh, speaks to my need to atone for my family's <laughs> sins um, in getting into the, the business of marine conservation. So uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, some of the work that I've done in the last five to 10 years to try to better understand humans, people's interaction with the ocean, the impact we're having on the ocean, and the impact the ocean is having on us. So uh, initially, I, I got into my research to try to understand how to uh, better protect the ocean from key issues like fishing. So I spent a lot of time researching and, and implementing with partners, uh, marine protected areas or marine reserves where you close off fishing from, from the ocean. But it, it quickly became obvious to me in my research and in my experience in the field that humans are having an impact on the oceans well beyond just these single issues. And the focus in management and in science on studying one issue at a time was kind of missing the point. And so uh, with many colleagues, we kind of took a step back and said, well, what is going on with the way humans are affecting the oceans from this big picture, the, the cumulative effect of all of these issues sort of layered on top of ecosystems and species, and how can we better understand what our impact is so that we can better manage for those issues. And what we did is we took each of these particular uses or impacts on the oceans, like commercial fishing, and layered them onto the planet one at a time climate change from ocean acidification or from warming seas. And as you layer these things one on top of the other, you start to see a picture emerge that is uh, greater than the sum of the parts. So this picture of the cumulative impact of human activities on the oceans starts to highlight these hot spots in red where all of these issues are converging at once and the blue spots where they're sort of uh, not having as much impact on the ocean. We've repeated this now uh, just recently to start to see how things have changed over time. And what you can see here then is where this cumulative impact is starting to increase, the red spots, and where we're actually seeing some decrease in cumulative impact, the blue areas. So together, when you see the hot spots of impact and the increases in impact, you start, or the decreases in impact, you start to understand where actions need to be taken to mitigate the most uh, impacted areas, and where there are seemingly success stories where we're starting to deal with some of the key issues and to decrease that overall impact. But we finished that work, uh, well, we continue it, but we finished that first analysis, and, and I stepped back and I, I realized that what that really was looking at is just the negative impact that people are having on the ocean, so just the way that we are hurting the ecosystems and hurting the species, but it didn't acknowledge in any way the fact that people are doing these activities because they're gaining benefit from fishing, from going to the beach for tourism, from developing along the coast. So our interaction with the oceans is about the benefits that we're getting, not just the negative impacts we're having. And this led to trying to better understand and therefore measure what it means to have a healthy ocean, a healthy ocean ecosystem. And when we started this project to develop the Ocean Health Index, one of the first things we struggled with as a, as a project was making really clear what we mean by healthy ocean. Does it mean a pristine system or does it mean something else? And we quickly realized, uh, both in the group and in the policy literature and in the scientific literature, that more and more people were defining healthy as something beyond just a pristine system because 
people are now part of every part of the planet. Even in the middle of the ocean, we are having an effect on the ocean and we are gaining benefits from the ocean. And if you have people everywhere, you can't have a healthy system that excludes people from it. And if you look at the policy documents, in fact, that's what you're seeing. So a place like this on the Great Barrier Reef can, in fact, be healthy if that's what we want the system to be. But systems that are used uh, can also be healthy if that use is done in a sustainable way. So you look at these policy documents that are coming out of the United States and the EU and Canada, Australia, developing countries in the Coral Triangle and Latin America, and all of them talk about wanting a healthy ocean with that meaning explicitly that people are thriving, human communities are thriving, as well as the natural ecosystem thriving. So it's really this joint, sustainable interaction of people and nature that makes for a healthy system. So this is what policy is asking for, and this is what the public is asking for. We need the science and the tools to measure how well we are achieving those objectives and to guide decisions towards those actions that are most likely to increase the ocean health. So if you reframe it this way and you think about healthy oceans as including people, you can have a Portuguese fishing village be a healthy ocean if the interaction with that natural system is done in a sustainable way. You can have a very urban place like San Francisco be healthy if the interaction of people with the ocean is done in a sustainable way. Now the problem is that there are hundreds if not thousands of indicators out there that measure physical attributes or ecological attributes or things about how people are impacting the ocean, or some composite measures that try to pull together different pieces of this. But it's overwhelming, the number of indicators. And none of them really gets at this overall idea of ocean health in a single measure. And so trying to pull together all of this information, all of this data, into a composite measure, a single index of ocean health was a real key motivation behind this project, the Ocean Health Index. And what we came up with is a, a way to measure overall ocean health that looks at it through 10 public goals about what people care about when they're interacting with the ocean. And this is the way we've visualized the results that come out of this kind of assessment. So each of these wedges of the pie or petals of the flower are one of these goals that range from extractive uses like food provision or natural products to uh, carbon storage to mitigate, mitigate against climate change, change, or protecting coasts from storm damage and erosion, as well as cultural uses like tourism and recreation, livelihoods and economies, and the sense of place we get from iconic species or really special places we go to. And of course, the classic conservation ones of biodiversity and clean waters. So if all 10 of these things are doing really well, that's undeniably a healthy system. And if all 10 are doing poorly, it's undeniably an unhealthy system. So this is the assessment from uh, this year of the single number for the health of the ocean, 65, and the status of each of these um, 10 goals uh, across the entire planet. Now, you may say, I don't like a single number for the entire planet. No management decisions are really made at a planetary scale. And that's fine, and in fact, we break it down country by country, and you can start to see the scores for different places on the planet. You see patterns emerge of where things are doing better and where uh, maybe the health of the ocean is not so good. You can get remote, fairly pristine places scoring very highly because they are in good condition. It's not just about human use. If we want those places to be pristine, and they are pristine, and they're healthy, but you also get places that are heavily populated that are having fairly good scores in their ocean health because they are interacting with the ocean in a sustainable way. But you may not care about the global picture. and You may want to zoom in and understand how particular countries are doing. So here's three examples, Seychelles, United States, and Philippines. And you can compare and contrast them to each other to try to understand why one country is doing better than the other. Often, neighboring countries like to compare themselves and see how they're doing. 
But you may be more interested in using this or understanding how health is changing over time in response to particular actions that are taken. And so you can track it through time and see whether things are increasing or decreasing. But maybe you're not interested in just this single number of the index, but you want to understand how all the pieces of the index are doing. And so you can break it apart into those 10 goals and ask for a particular country how each of the 10 goals are doing to see where some are doing well and others are maybe needing improvement. And of course, you can then start to track that over time to see how particular goals, not just the overall index, are responding to particular management actions. And if you track this through enough time, you can start to see trade-offs between or among goals in response to particular actions to understand how management is affecting pieces of overall ocean health as well as the big picture of overall ocean health. And so by providing a way to pull back to the single number as well as dive into all of the pieces, the index provides a framework to inform management decisions and to communicate about this broad concept of ocean health to many different audiences, the public policymakers, decision makers, and scientists. Now, to um, really tap into the best available information and data and understanding about a region, you would want to tailor the index to that information for that particular region. And to demonstrate how you can do that, rather than looking at the global picture, we've initiated several regional applications, the ones in orange, where we have um, led the effort to assess in Brazil the 17 different coastal states of Brazil, the west coast of the United States, which I'll show you in a second, and Fiji. But there's already been a lot of traction and, and uptake of the index, I think because it's really feeding into this need that policymakers have to assess and measure this goal they've laid out for themselves of healthy oceans. So in Colombia and China, the governments have um, adopted the index as a tool they're going to use to guide management decisions, in part motivated by disappointment in the score they got and feeling like they needed to tap into their own information to better understand and better represent what the status of their oceans were. Ecuador and Peru just last week, the governments initiated government-sponsored efforts to do the same. And then NGO academic partnerships are leading efforts in Canada, the Baltic Sea, Israel, and New Caledonia. It's also uh, being used in the United Nations World Ocean Assessment as well as um, uh, the World Bank to guide global environment facility investment in developing countries to improve ocean conditions. So just in two years since being launched, we've seen a lot of regional uptake of the index, which is really exciting. To demonstrate what you can do at a regional level, so here's the west coast of the United States where I come from, and you can start to break it apart into its regions, um, either political or biogeographic. So in California, we split it into three regions that are biogeographic. It's a very big state. Uh, but we also divide by in the um, states by political boundaries as well. And you can start to get a zoomed-in regional view of what's going on to inform decision-making uh, decisions at a smaller and smaller scale. This allows you, again, to tap into the best available information, to tailor the index to the policy targets and needs of that context, and of course, tap into um, a local understanding of these sub-regional differences. So you gain a lot by being able to zoom in and really understand what's going on. But just to give one example of the kind of decision making um, I think you can uh, inform with the index, uh, looking at the lens of addressing climate change. So the index allows you to capture and quantify where climate change is affecting issues beyond maybe the most obvious, like ocean acidification, which of course is in there. But climate change is having a, an impact across many different aspects of ocean health. So if you look at these 10 goals that we describe the health of the ocean by, they're both direct and indirect ways that climate change is affecting basically every single one of these goals. And the index captures that through the architecture of how it's measuring change in these goals. So you can understand where climate change is affecting these goals, measure it through time, and see how climate change is changing them as well as how other actions might be mitigating climate change impacts on these different goals. So it provides a framework for broadening the perspective of why we should be caring about 
climate change, as an example. Of course, it allows you to um, assess effectiveness of mitigation aspect, uh, activities um, with respect to overall ocean health rather than just particular issues. So obviously, the main problem with climate change is global, dealing with CO2 emissions. But there's lots of things that can be done at local scales that can have local benefits to help mitigate against climate change. And the index allows you, if you measure it at regional scales, to understand and, and capture those changes. And you can also use it as a decision support tool to sort of run scenarios through the index and say, well, if we take this kind of action against climate change at global or regional scales, and we expect it to have this effect on the planet uh, through the models, how does that translate into these measures of overall ocean health? And is it having the effect that we want? Where are the trade-offs that maybe we didn't anticipate initially that might change the decisions we make? And so coupling the index with other types of tools for decision making, you can start to get a sense of or anticipate where your changes are likely to lead or actions are likely to lead into the future. So I want to end with a short movie that uh, we made to kind of give a, a sense of, of what the index is trying to do. It's a bit promotional, so apologies for the oversell, but I think it gives a nice sense of, of what we were trying to do. has been migrating, feeding, and multiplying, evolving in a dynamic array of dazzling ecosystems. And for hundreds of thousands of years, humans have thrived, living off the bounty of the seas. But as our civilization grew increasingly complicated, the systems below that helped fuel that growth suffered. We took for granted all the things the seas supply. Half the world's oxygen, food for a billion people, jobs for over 500 million. Our oceans are at a tipping point. How can we regain the delicate balance? Can something so vast and unknown be measured and managed? The oceans are the lungs of the planet. And if we don't know what the health of the oceans are, we really don't know what the health of our planet is. We need a baseline for where the oceans are at now. What you can't measure, you can't manage. And you just can't do it without numbers. It's never been done for the oceans because it's really hard. It was not something that was really possible to do uh, very far in the past. It's tricky business. It's vital business. And somebody has to do it. It took over three years, over 60 scientists, researchers, and organizations to come up with a way to measure the health of the world's oceans, to calculate how much we can take, we can use, we can disturb, and still keep our seas vibrant and productive. It is okay to use the ocean. What we cannot do is to exploit it as we have been doing. People are now part of the ocean. There's so many of us and all the things that we do are so pervasive in the ocean that we're really part of it now. And we need to be able to take the places that are being successful in interacting with the sea and replicate what they're doing in places where there are problems. So a healthy ocean has both an intact natural system and a human system, a human community that's able to benefit from the ocean. We need healthy, sustainable oceans now and for future generations. Check out the Ocean Health Index. It's a new language, it's easy to learn, and it's just a click away. A healthy ocean, a healthy future. you've enjoyed that short presentation. Um, I'm excited to hear the panelists discuss uh, the various ways that we interact with the ocean and for your questions and answer following that. So thank you for your time.
Right, so what we're going to do is, um, Ben's joined our panel. We've got a really exciting array of panellists coming from a range of different perspectives around uh, the use, the conservation, the management of the ocean. Um, I'm just going to introduce them to you very quickly. And then um, each of them are going to give just a very short three to five minutes from their perspective about where we are with the ocean from their point of view, um, what kind of issues and challenges we face in the 21st century, and their views about um, how we might move forward to um, address those challenges. Nice, short, um, unambitious brief for five minutes, but that's what they're going to do, three to five minutes. And then I'm going to throw it open to questions and discussion from the audience. We'll take some questions and then we'll let the panellists um, talk around those questions. So hopefully we'll have a nice stimulating hour or so from now on. So you already heard about Ben. Sitting next to Ben is Heather Caldaway. So Heather Caldaway heads the Marine and Freshwater Programme and is curator of aquarium projects at the Zoological Society of London. And she's got a PhD from UCL and University College Swansea and is also co-director of Project Seahorses, which is one of the most innovative and exciting conservation projects involving artisanal fishers in the developing world. That's Heather. Next to Heather is Essam Yassin Mohammed, who is a senior researcher in the Sustainable Markets Group at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Before that, he worked at the Ministry of Fisheries in Eritrea, and he has a PhD in international development from um, Nagoya University in Japan. Sitting next to Essam is Stuart Bradley. So Stuart Bradley is strategy manager for off offshore renewables in the Energy Technology Institute. And he's a marine engineer by profession who has a PhD in mechanical engineering from Brunel University. And he's worked on technologies for the rail, defense, automotive power, and marine industries. So um, very different perspective there. And at the end, behind the pillar, <laughs> is David Agnew, who's the standards director for the Mean Stewardship Council. Before that, he was fisheries director at uh, Marine Resources Assessment Group. And he was a senior research fellow at Imperial College in London. And he's got a PhD in marine biology from Glasgow. So a really interesting, eminent panel who's going to have um, lots of exciting things to say. So maybe we'll start with Heather. Um. <laughs> um, thank you. Yes, the very tight uh, brief that we've had. And it was a great introduction um, by Ben in terms of talking. So while he came up with this amazing indicator, um, I've still been carrying on with MPAs. So my brief tonight is to talk a little bit about um, where we're at with marine protected areas and where we're going. Um, and I think marine protected areas are one area of ocean conservation that has traction and are one of the things that we can focus on as a success and somewhere that we're moving forward with. So globally there's 200,000 protected areas and people understand the concept of protected areas and setting aside parts of land or sea um, for uh, man either management or protection is something that makes sense. So simply speaking, if you don't catch fish in an area of ocean, those fish that are left will be more of them and they'll grow bigger. And even in the most sustainable of fishery, at the end of the day, fishing still kills fish. So protecting through uh, setting up marine protected areas is one way we can look at sustainable management and it's one way we can start to secure a future. So it's definitely just one tool in our toolbox, but it's an effective one. Um, and, uh, and hundreds of scientific studies have really shown how effective those are. I think the good news over the last decade is that there's been a five-fold increase in the global coverage of marine protected areas and this just shows that they do have that traction. And community managed uh, marine protected areas are one really great um, expanding tool that we're seeing popping up in lots of different parts of the world. And my experience really comes from working in the Philippines for many years and working with communities to self-manage their own marine protected areas. And over the last few years, we've helped set up 35 uh, different marine protected areas that are entirely managed by communities. And when they're well looked after, they work. We see more fish. We see higher biodiversity, we see better coral coverage, and we see fish that swim outside, creating a better fishery for those communities. The uh, com communities themselves, even though these are people who face um, great challenges from increasing family sizes and depleted resources, see these protected areas as a solution. It's something that they can actively do to secure their future. They see them as a lifeline, and they see them as a bank. So they really have almost a, a huge um, exponential rate of increase that we really can almost not keep up with demand um, for. 
At the other end of the spectrum, um, I also work in some of the, the last ocean wilderness areas, particularly the UK overseas ter territories. The largest no-take marine protected area in the world is currently the Chagos Archipelago, which is British, and is truly one of these healthy areas. It's nice to see it looking um, there in blue. And to, to actually go there and work there and, and work on that protected area, you really see what the oceans should look like. And these large, the increase in these large marine protected areas has really helped to secure a much greater area of protection. In fact, 23% of the protection in the last uh, few years, or since 2010, have come from just three large marine protected areas, two of which are UK overseas territories. But it's not just metrics of cover. We need to look at how effective these protected areas are. We need to look at how they're providing, helping provide ecosystem services. We need to look at how much um, uh, they're actually um, protecting in terms of different types of environments and different types of habitats. And we're still well short of the political targets that have been set globally of 10% by 2020. So what do I think are the barriers of success? Well, I've got five quick points um, on that. Firstly, 64% of our oceans are high seas, so they're outside national jurisdiction, which means whatever these assessments we're doing, we need to look at setting new laws and new frameworks to protect those areas. Politics. Um, it's something that scientists and conservationists, you don't want to get involved with, and then you do have to get involved with. Um, but basically, Australia is a great example. They set up a fantastic network of protected areas in 2013, um, which are not being implemented because the new government decided on a new round of consultation. Of course, that can work the other way. When that um, well-known environmentalist, George Bush, um, set up the uh, Papahanao Makukea, uh, <laughs> sorry for <laughs> brutalizing that. I watched Octonauts lots of times for that. Um, Marine National Mon Monument. And so there is opportunities for polit politics to work um, one way or an another. We often get stuck in this grumble zone, as I've heard it called, um, of consultation and uh, going round in circles. And that's a classic example of what's happening here in the UK, particularly in England, where we've spent three years, eight million pounds, came up with an agreed network of 127 marine conservation zones, and through opening up that grumble zone, we're now at 27. We don't know how to manage. Finally, um, sustainable financing. I think we're going to touch on that later, but most marine protected areas, we can make them work, but we haven't secured the sustainable financing system. At ZSL, we're doing some pretty cool, innovative ways of doing it, including using mechanisms of collect communities collecting disused fishing nets, waste fishing nets off the beaches, setting up saving systems that connect with marine conservation that feed into a global recycling market that makes beautiful carpet tiles, slightly shinier than these. Um, but this is a, a different way of, of looking at um, financing approaches that are going to support marine conservation in the future. And finally, I think one of the things we really need to look at, and Ben touched on again, is that we're stuck in a doom and gloom narrative, particularly about the oceans, and we need to move away from that. Around World Oceans Day, a small group of us just tried a small experiment on social media, on Twitter. We tried sharing stories of success and positivity about solutions for what we're doing with our oceans. And there are a number of those, many of those, but they don't make the news very easily. So we used the hashtag Ocean Optimism. And not, it wasn't just fluffy, pretty stories. It was really tangible, science-based stories of success. And we just put... 14 of us put some stories out there. It went that aspirational viral, and in eight days we reached 1.77 million people using that hashtag. And if you search for it, you'll see that there's lots of good stories. It's not only a nice communication piece, it's a great way of sharing success and replicating it. How would somebody in Costa Rica know about a success in Bangladesh? It's very difficult for people on the ground to know what to do. And so I think we need to look more positively and talk more positively about solutions and how we replicate those. So there. Okay. So, yes, All right. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for previous speakers here, yeah, Ben. That was an excellent, very mesmerizing presentation. Yeah, and it's very annoying to sit next to somebody who just covers all your points. Sorry. <laughs> 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 but but I, I, liked, I liked Ben's introduction uh, when he started uh, with his personal uh, journey or story, and I think I will try. To, I will attempt to do something similar. Uh, I was 
I was born in Libya, obviously, uh, in the coastal area of Libya, and then we moved back to Eritrea, which is again a coastal state. And um, I, I come from a very traditional family. You know, my parents always wanted me to be an accountant and a lawyer and an economist and an engineer of that sort. But uh, to my parents' profound disappointment, I decided to study marine biology and fishery science. And uh, I ended up being a marine biologist. And um, I had um, the immense pleasure of murdering about 600 species, uh, specimens of one species called uh, uh, orange face butterfly fish. They are one of the most beautiful fish species one can find in the oceans. And uh, the, with the purpose of uh, you know, extracting their gonads and uh, you know, embedding them in wax and slicing them and, uh, and observing under the microscope and um, conclude on about their reproductive cycle. And that's what I did for almost four years uh, when I was in Eritrea. And then there was uh, a mentor of mine, uh, uh, Professor Gordon Sato, who was a Japanese American professor who uh, challenged me once, saying, you know, how are you going to feed your people with this kind of science? And I was, I was really disappointed when he said, obviously, but <laughs> when I thought about it carefully later on, I think I thought he might have a point. And um, that's when I realized there is uh, something beyond the fish. And to come to your point, Ben, you know, there are people, human beings are part and parcel of that whole ecosystem as well. So we do need to factor in the needs and wants of uh, these uh, people who, who's, who survive or live uh, or sort of depend on uh, fisheries or oceans ecosystems for their livelihoods. Um, that's how I ended up being in the development sector. I went on to study uh, development economics and uh, that's uh, why I do what I do now. Um, so where we, at, where we are at now, I like either your message about positivity, I do like that. Uh, I do like the idea of, you know, we need to move beyond the doom and gloom of uh, oceans, ecosystems, or fisheries in general. We do need to talk about solutions at the moment. Um, there are these repeated figures that we all recite them by heart now, which are the, you know, at least 80% of our fisheries resources are either exploited or over-exploited, blah, blah. Uh, but I think beyond that, I think the positive uh, bit of the story is there is a, a growing uh, awareness of, uh, at the global scale on fisheries and oceans issues now, at least compared to the 1990s. I was so pleased when I heard somebody comparing this decade to the 1990s for forests, if that makes sense at all. So I think there is, there is a very, very growing demand, I'm mean, sorry, uh, awareness indeed from different stakeholders, particularly at a global uh, level. So uh, as you know, there are a number of initiatives out there, the 15, 10, or the global partnerships for oceans, you know, and et cetera, et cetera. So th there's a lot of hope out there that there's going to be uh, uh, some positive change over the next uh, decade or so. Um, but talking about at the global level, uh, I'm, I'm, I sit with this uh, uh, panel called uh, the LDC Independent Expert Group on post-2015. Uh, as you all know, the MDGs are expiring, and now we're trying to define a new era of development, or what we call the post-2015. Some call it the SDGs. We don't know sure. We're not sure yet. Uh, but um, we are still in that process of uh, negotiating, and there's quite a, a number of uh, uh, intergovernmental processes going on out there, uh, which can be uh, a bit painstaking, to be honest with you. But uh, the fun bit of it is I get to go to New York quite often, so I can't complain, really. Uh, the, the, again, on a positive note, uh, uh, there's going to be some trade-off involved here. Not all... Uh, goals are going to be included in the post-2015 issues, but uh, the issue on marine seas and oceans has survived so far. We have uh, shortlisted them to about 17 goals so far, and marine and fisheries issues is one of them. So I think it has made it all the way through up to now, and now when the intergovernmental process starts, hopefully it's going to come to the forefront of uh, the debate as well. Uh, the issues on MPAs here are uh, adequately mentioned uh, in that, uh, which uh, suggests about, I think the target is to ensure that about 10% of our global coastal areas are protected 
so which is quite promising by 2020 that is uh, uh, talking about the barriers to success uh, I'm trying to be very quick here again I have um, five quick points as he there would put it uh, I think one is there are quite a number of overlooked issues uh, for so many reasons uh, the goalposts have been shifting quite a lot lately, and uh, there's been so much uh, emphasis on uh, climate change, ocean acidification issues, for instance, which is quite legitimate, actually. I do uh, recognize the danger that uh, uh, climate change may pose on ocean ecosystems, but I think there are quite a significant problems, such as marine debris, for instance, that need to be uh, addressed. But uh, they are not uh, being, uh, they are partly being overlooked, I would say, so I think we need to discuss more and debate more about those issues. Um, uh, without repeating Hither's point again, uh, the governance gap in the high seas is very, very important issue because it's no man's land there out there. Uh, you go, if you go 200 nautical miles beyond your coastal area, then it's not governed. There's a massive uh, governance gap there. We're talking about 50% of our planet's surface area. So it's quite a... a a huge uh, um, ecosystem that need to be governed, and there is a governance gap. But I think we're coming closer towards filling this governance gap through the Global Oceans Commission, for instance, which is trying, trying to sort of fill that gap. And uh, there is another panel in New York in the UN system as well, which is also making efforts to sort of uh, fill these uh, gaps. Uh, the third issue is uh, I think there is a, a traditional disconnect between science or science and policy making and consumers and I think we need to we do need to bridge that gap uh, there's a lot amazing science being done by many science many of you are doing here and uh, which does not is not necessarily effectively communicated with policy makers or is not necessarily very well comprehended by the local consumers or the ordinary citizens so we do need to bridge this gap and in IRED in an effort to make an attempt to uh, bridge this gap, we have set up a, a, an online platform called Fishnet, which uh, is an online uh, community that brings uh, researchers, policymakers, and consumers together to interact and share knowledge and ideas. So uh, I do encourage you all to come and join us, uh, you know, be members of the Fishnet, uh, Fishnet uh, platform, and um, do share your opinions, ideas, share your success stories with the rest of the world. Um, uh, again, Ben's point earlier, you know, bringing people at the forefront of the debate is very important because you know, we, we talk, you know, when we talk about the health of the oceans or fisheries, we do need to talk about human beings being as part and parcel of that whole um, ecosystem. So um, we do, one of the things I would like to highlight with, at this, with, uh, with this point is, we do set up marine protected areas, for instance, or we do impose some restrictions on fishers. Uh, but we do need to recognize that you know, there is some sort of at least short-term cost incurred on these communities or these mostly marginalized communities, fisher communities. So uh, we do need to introduce a, a, an economic incentive mechanism, at least, that would compensate their loss in earnings, at least their short-term earnings. My final point is the lack of uh, sufficient data. I think we, we do live in a world which is a data poor world, really, particularly when it comes to fishery. So I think we do need to generate more information. Uh, a classic example is that you know, what leads to overexploitation of resource most of the time is because they are undervalued or not valued by the market systems. So we do need to create a market system, for instance, I, I mean, you may not necessarily agree with me, but to sort of put a monetary value on these ecosystems and make due uh, policy uh, uh, decisions based on that. One of the initiatives that we're doing now is in partnership with UCL, Ben is sitting there, uh, is we're working on a blue capital report at the moment where we're trying to unleash or uncover or highlight the importance of these ecosystems and uh, and communicate them effectively with policymakers and making a case for them to invest in marine and coastal ecosystems as a, an economic infrastructure. Great. Thank Thanks, you very Lisa. much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm coming from a somewhat 
at uh, different backgrounds to everybody else. Instead of conservation, I'm looking at marine exploitation, and in particular, for uh, generating energy from the uh, marine industry. Um, marine energy is in the early stages of development at the moment, and it can be summarized into two different types. There are waterproof uh, wind turbines that sit at the bottom of the sea and turn and make electricity. And there's wave energy that floats and bobs around and, again, creates energy uh, in the same way. The, the, the UK is, uh, has got a tremendous amount of uh, potential. Um, in tidal stream, we have around about 20 terawatt hours per year. Um, that's, a, that's a big number. It sounds really impressive, but you have to bear in mind that the UK's energy demand is about 350 terawatt hours. Uh, but we also have uh, wave energy as well, and that's around about the same amount of uh, resource. So we could meet somewhere between uh, 20 and 25 percent of the UK's energy demand uh, using uh, marine energy. Um, I'm going to keep this really short because I think we're in a bit of a hurry to get to the questions. Um, where are we going on that? Well, um, the next three to five years is going to be critical uh, to the development of the UK industry. Uh, we have uh, the first arrays are out in uh, demonstration up at Orkney at the moment at the um, European Marine Energy Centre, which is uh, supported by the UK government and by the EU. Um, barriers to success are um, mostly commercial, uh, economic uh, barriers. Uh, so if we can get the, the cost of this type of energy um, as low as possible, and we can engage with the public more and gain acceptance because these devices are not ugly, they don't blight the countryside, and uh, uh, they're very benign uh, to the environment, then I'm, I'm sure that we can get good acceptance. Excellent. Well, thank, thank you, Stuart. I'll be um, challenged to keep it as short as you did, so <laughs> um, congratulations. Uh, great to be back in uh, Imperial College. It's wonderful to see this room looking full, unlike most undergraduate lectures. So um, congratulations, everyone, for coming along, and thanks, um, EJ, for organizing it. Uh, ben, uh, very interesting, uh, great presentation. It's interesting that we're now, after our... Um, dive into depression, we're all talking about optimism. And quite a lot of that optimism is based around governments, what governments can do. And um, the Marine Stewardship Council, as many of you may know, arose from the realization that governments were actually fairly useless at doing things, unless they were kicked along by civil society. So uh, the MSC was a civil society mechanism. It grew up in the mid-90s, along with the Forestry Stewardship Council, with uh, Fair Trade and all these other ones. And it was a partnership between industry and um, NGOs. And it has remained a very delicate but very strong partnership in that same way um, ever since. And the only reason it continues to be successful is because it is that partnership. Um, so uh, way from being <coughs> a dictatorial approach, it is a partnership. We've got 240 fisheries now in the program. 10% of the world's fisheries are certified. Um, that by volume. Um, we have a, um, about 10% in the developing world. We have about another 100 fisheries queuing up to get certified. We've got um, 2,700 individual supply chain partners across the world carrying fish. We're in 30 countries um, for fisheries certification and about 40 uh, countries for the supply chain. So the whole thing is knitting together very nicely very successful, um, but it's just a continual struggle to make it work. And the continual struggle is the compromises that various players have to make, that is between NGOs um, who wish that we, in many cases, just were not even on the planet. Um, but as you say, we've got to accept that we are. Um, and uh, the industry who wish that they didn't have to get MSC certification, but by they're being told by their markets that they need it, and once they've got it, they very often find that they've got a more successful fishery as a result. One of our most successful fisheries is actually a developing world fishery, which is the South African hake, which got certified um, 10 years ago so that it could access northern European markets. And um, as one of the <coughs> conditions of certification, it's reduced albatross catches now by 99%. 
It took um, bird life some time to come up with the number because it's quite difficult to calculate how many albatross you're actually killing. Um, but on the other hand, the fishery itself has been estimated to be worth an extra 35% value added um, in income to um, South Africa. And that includes an extra secured employment for about 3,000 processors, um, uh, people actually in South Africa that are delivering, uh, taking home pay that's beyond, uh, above the South African um, average pay. So these things do tend to work because people see benefits across the way. So that's where we are. Um, uh, we are very science-based. We are very outcome-based in our approach. And um, uh, if I move on to issues and challenges quickly, because I've got EJ on my back here, um, it's very, very nice to see that the focus has moved away from fisheries. Um, in the early 90s, fisheries were the only real focus for degradation and accusation of degradation in marine systems. But we've always had, and we have increasingly, plastics pollution, runoff, transport, energy extraction, deep sea marine ex exploration now. Um, uh, in, uh, the Koreans are investing very, very heavily in um, nodule extraction. Um, that is marine nodule extraction. Uh, coastal resource pressure is increasing, and this is, in many countries, simply a function of population growth. Acidification and climate change are always at the heart of this, but an interesting feature of them is that they are moving ecosystems around the globe into areas that management systems are not currently able to deal with. On a trivial basis, you may have, and even in Australia, you have uh, the situation that a fish species is managed by New South Wales and Victoria catches it at a bycatch. But as a result of warming, that species is now occurring mostly in Victoria and has no legislation and management system associated with it that is based in Victoria. It's all still based in New, in New South Wales. And this will happen a million times around the world as we deal with it. And this changing governance structure is a key element. I've heard people talk about the governance, the governance gap in the high seas. Actually, there is a governance gap in the high seas, but it's pretty well covered, and it's really difficult to see how we would deal with it in any other structures than the ones we've got at the moment. That is multinational, um, I mean, multi-governmental um, uh, systems. Unless we were to go back and renegotiate the law of the sea and extend our EEZs out until they all met in the middle of the oceans, and then everyone would have national and flag state responsibility in the, in the notion. If we don't do that, we've got to deal with the mechanisms. And I've spoken to people who were involved in the United Nations um, Vulnerable Marine Ecosystem debate um, some eight years ago now, and they said they got it through by the skin of the teeth. If they'd been six months delayed, it would have been entirely blocked. So the UN is not a better negotiation um, platform than the current regional fisheries management organizations. Though I notice that we've got the BBNJ, the, the uh, Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which I hope will give another layer of international management there. So moving forwards, I actually think we have very many of the tools that we need. We don't generally apply them. MPAs are certainly one of those tools. They're not universally um, uh, applicable, nor are they university, uh, universally the solution to everything. They're certainly part of the mix, and we in the MSC acknowledge that they're part of the mix. Constraining capacity, constraining human development, constraining human access and availability and um, activity is really key to it. Um, even in, um, I've been I've been switched off. <laughs> Sorry, speak. I'll oh, speak louder. <laughs> um, uh, China and Southeast Asia came up on your map very clearly, and yes, China and Southeast Asia are very, very much key focal areas for us um, uh, to develop into the future. And um, seeing I've been switched off, I've pretty much come to the end of my message anyway. Thank Good. you. Okay, am I still on? Uh, no. No, okay, I'll talk loudly too. Imperial's gone home. We've all gone home, yeah. Six o'clock. Right. The energy's gone. So, energy's gone. <laughs> <laughs> you should, you should go talk to your man. So, guys, 50 penny renewables. what I want from the audience now is challenging, provocative questions that are going to cut across a number of the different issues that people have brought up. So not specific questions to individuals. You can talk to them as individuals over your glass of wine later. 
but interesting questions that cut across what the people have said. So, does anyone, you put your hand up very quickly. Uh, I was wondering about, we're talking about policy and governance and in relation to the uh, Ocean Health Index, how we know what the right baseline is to compare with what is the healthy ocean. Because depending on where you take a baseline 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, it makes a huge difference. Okay, so that's a general question in terms of baselines, I think, but we can start with Ben. Now, it's a really, really good question, and the, the, the answer comes down to it depends <laughs> on what people want. So you have, it's, a, it's a social and a political decision about what you can achieve and what you want to achieve. So we're not going to return the planet to pre-human conditions. No one wants that, and it's not possible. We probably can't even get it back to pre-industrial or pre-World War II even. So we need to set ambitious targets, but ones that are realistic too. And that, the index is one example of making that process very transparent and deliberate so that you are clear about what you're trying to achieve. And, and when you're clear about that, then you can argue about it in an open way and have an informed debate rather than uh, people arguing but not realizing what they're arguing about. But it's a fundamental question about what we are trying to achieve. Does anyone else? Heather. Yeah, I think um, from my point of view, this is where some of these sites, the, that's why I got involved in working with these uh, ocean wilderness areas, because these are sites that um, are the closest to reference points that we have in the ocean and are really understudied. So they give us the chance to look at some current ba baselines and also to help set targets. Oh, now I'm shouty. Um, so I think those, those are the places... Um, that uh, generally are, are very poorly studied because they are remote, they are isolated, um, but offer a great opportunity, certainly from the studies that have been done in the Chagos Archipelago, for example, on reef recovery after major bleaching events in 1998, showed that in the absence of other pressures like pollution um, and so on, that you saw a very rapid and very um, comprehensive recovery of those reefs, whereas in other places they were either completely lost or still remain heavily impacted by that. Um, so these sites have become really important. They become ever more important as around them becomes more degraded. And certainly for me, on a personal note, um, going to Chagos showed me what the ocean should look like. And I thought I'd dive some really cool dives until I went there. So even as scientists and conservationists, our baselines have completely shifted. And so even just to try and recalibrate that and realize what we have lost in some places and what <coughs> targets we should set that are realistic, yet ambitious, is what we should be focused on. OK, another question? Um, further to Hang on, wait a minute. There's a microphone. Further to the last question. There we are, guys. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of measurement, I noticed that one of your categories was, was sense of place. And I was wondering how one began to, uh, to measure that, and indeed whether those 10 indicators that you have, are they equal, equally weighted, or do they, is there um, a set of weighting between them? Uh, I, I'd love to, love to refer to the index and use it, but I'd like to have a little bit more confidence that it's, uh, it's well founded. Thank yeah. you. Uh, well, uh, there's about 200 pages of documentation that explain all this, so uh, but to, to briefly respond to both of your questions, which are, are great ones, um, the, you can indeed, um, to the second one, change the weight of the goals. So I, sh I represented them as equally important, but we spend quite a bit of time in the work we've done demonstrating why and how you can change those weights depending on what people value more for particular places. And again, making that process transparent. So people in their heads all the time are making these kinds of subjective decisions that are based on what they care about. I am a fisherman, so I care more about fishing extraction and uh, tourism. I, or, so those two things matter most to me. If those things are doing well, the ocean is healthy. We're making those judgments in our head. The index is one way of making that transparent and so that you can communicate about what those values are. So you can definitely change the weights of the different goals. And now I'm forgetting the first question. Sense of place. Sense of place. Thank you. Uh, so you're right. I mean, cultural values are very difficult to kind of capture in a quantitative way. The way we look at it is through iconic species and places that are culturally or aesthetically or spiritually um, valuable to, 
to people. And if these iconic species or these places are in good condition, people feel like the ocean is doing better. And you can measure the extinction status of species or the degradation of particular places through measures of protection. Uh, so th there are ways to quantify what is otherwise some, an abstract concept. And what's interesting is this is just one small study we did, but we looked at, I know, I know, but give me a platform and I'm going to use it. Um, we, we surveyed uh, stakeholders along the west coast of the United States across the full spectrum, fishermen to conservationists, about what are the values, what are the goals they care about most. And there was broad consensus across all of them that sense of place was the most important to them. So it's a really universally important aspect of ocean health that needs to be measured and included. And whether you agree with our approach or want to develop a different approach, it needs to be in there. Excellent. So who's got a question for the other half of the panel? <laughs> right at the back there. Yeah. Um, it has two parts, and it's about the role of the private sector. Uh, someone mentioned the issue of conservation funding, um, so I would be really interested in, in hearing more about that, and also the issue of data poverty, and was wondering whether you had any thoughts about how the private sector can leverage what it, what it um, uses for its own commercial activities to contribute to uh, marine data collection, and whether you know big data is something that has a role to play. So we'll start with Stuart, and then... Move on. Crikey. Okay. Um, <laughs> hmm. When we've been trying to um, extract energy from the ocean, we've uh, we've had to obviously look at the environmental impact of putting devices into the seas around the UK. And uh, for some of that uh, funding, we've uh, we've got that either from a private industry as a uh, as a levy, or we've had uh, government assistance from that. Um, as regards the data, um, then we're, we're kind of in the, uh, in the process of extracting data right now with some of the uh, devices that we have up at, uh, up at Orkney. Uh, and, and that's in terms of um, some of the environmental data like tide flows, temperatures, and, uh, and, and salinity and so on. Uh, but also in terms of um, the types of species that we see um, that begin to populate the area around the uh, disturbed seabed. Uh, so we've been doing quite a lot of uh, research on, on, on the, uh, the rate of change uh, and the types of species. Yeah. Okay. Quick comments from David and um, Yeah, funding, really great question. Um, so I'm not in a position to really talk about conservation funding because I think Heather's probably a better position than that. But um, this, this idea of, of, <coughs> of where the money comes from to create change is key to the model that the MSC uses. And that is that the money is provided as a continuous supply um, from the demand market. So the money does go through. It does create the requirement to change and to collect data, for instance. Um, but it keeps coming so long as you keep certified. And that's the big difference in my mind between our previous approaches to investment funding, particularly in fisheries or anything else, is that we tend to be very, very good at chucking money at a problem and solving it and then saying, great, job done. What we are very bad at is continuing to ensure that, that um, uh, the uh, change is, is maintained, that the, um, the sustainability that is produced, that the data continue to be collected. Strangely enough, part of our problem in the late 18, uh, 1980s and the reason we had such a bad problem in Europe in the early 1990s from a fisheries point of view was the fact that our, um, uh, the genre of, of operation created by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan in the mid-1980s diverted an awful lot of money away from basic research and basic data collection. So when it came to the crunch in the early 90s, we had no idea what was happening to our fish stocks because it was data poverty. So we had removed the ability, and that was because we relied on the funding from governments to provide that, that data. Um, uh, the ability for us to continue to create, me to, to create mechanisms that continue to incentivize a change and reward that change through marketplace um, uh, developments 
is, is key. There's a lot of talk about alternative finance mechanisms, green bonds, blue bonds, whatever. These all need to rely on the fact that there's a continuing supply of, mo of money coming from the changed item after the change. And that is not so clear when it comes to things like the Chagos initiative, how that money is going to continue to be generated because there is no additional, the, the, the amount of money you're generating from additional diving opportunities, never that, that you may go several times to dive, and I'm not doubting that it's great fun, um, but the amount of money that you can generate from that is um, unlikely to pay for the continued surveillance cost of maintaining that as a green area, and that's a real challenge for us. Excellent. Quick, Miss Sam. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, I think on data poverty, that's a very good question. I think uh, there, there are two. You can disaggregate into two. Uh, one is the lack of data, which is that means there is no data available that need to be addressed, of course. And the other one is the reliability of data as well, or the existing data. In the lack of data, I think it's the most striking example is that one of out of the 1,500 uh, commercially targeted fisheries stocks. The, uh, the only reliable data available is for only 500, which is only one third of the total commercially targeted fish, fishery stocks. So I think that really signifies the, um, the seriousness of the lack of data. And the other is on the reliability of data, which is, I mean, in some countries, such as, for instance, in China until recently, for instance, where governments had a certain target for each province and they had to meet that target, whatever, you know, whether they catch that uh, level of fish or not, they had to report. Uh, that targeted level of uh, fish catch. So that also puts this uh, a massive, a huge question mark on the reliability of some of the data that's collected as well. On the role of the private sector in mitigating this problem, I think I'm sure there can be a significant role. Uh, one way that I can suggest perhaps is as part of their supply chain risk management strategy, uh, they would have an interest in uh, understanding the, I mean, having a better understanding of the stock that's available or the resource that's available as part of their risk management strategy. Uh, if I may add one more point, very, 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 very briefly, there is a f very hot from the oven, very, I mean, new report that just came out that was led by Annabelle Leighton there inside and with EJ and myself that uh, we reviewed a conservation trust fund for marine and coastal management uh, from around 12 countries. And uh, I think that has just come out a few days ago and that might shed some light and provide some response to your question. Well, if you're advertising that, that's fine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just on the uh, data side, I think uh, with as an impoverished conservation NGO, we're finding a huge role for citizen science and um, new technology as well. So um, all Londoners should be involved in monitoring uh, marine mammals on the Thames, which is one of our programmes, as is um, eels. And we've found a great engagement of hundreds of people who just want to do something more interesting than their day job. And so counting eels on the Thames is a great way of doing that. Um, so the, uh, and also we, we're using apps and technology has been a huge asset to start recording everything from uh, camera chaps in the Serengeti, less marine, uh, through to uh, seahorses that you might see on your diving holiday. Um, in terms of private sector, I think there's a huge role for new and innovative partnerships, and we need to be a bit sort of braver about connecting with different um, opportunities. We've had a fantastic experience wor working with Interface, which is a leading carpet tile manufacturer um, who, with a very, very ambitious, uh, not uh, just a CSR, but innovation strategy on how to be carbon neutral and have a mission zero by uh, 2020. And they're well on track. And basically, carpets are pretty oil, so that's a pretty... Um, cool target. Um, so working with them um, has been a completely new partnership. They look at restorative business. It's not just trying to do things less badly or hope that you can get away with it, but they look at doing things better and actually improving things. And this collection of uh, waste fishing nets, discarded fishing nets, is a pilot project, but we've collected 32 and a half tonnes um, in a short period of time, helping over 2,000 families. Um, you know, that's a lot of net that would be otherwise lying on the beaches or ghost fishing in the ocean. So I think, you know, setting out, stepping out of the uh, comfort zone, working with new partners, seeing how we can provide some of the answers or approaches with our experiences on the ground um, is an exciting new way, a um, bit of yeah. an adventure. I promise two really quick points, but my first is I actually think we are awash in data and that there is so much data out there, so many data out there that we are not tapping into. I think, so I have a very different perspective on that. 
And my second point is related is I think if we wait for data, we will never ever do anything because there's always more information we need. And the stock assessments is a great example. That the reason there are only about 500 that have been formally assessed is it's very expensive. It's something like a million dollars a year for every single stock and that won't work in most of the world. So we have to develop and there are developed data poor methods for doing these kinds of managements. They shift the burden of proof mm -hmm. to a different kind of conservation or uh, precautionary approach, but we have methods out there and we need to develop more of them because if we're waiting for data, we'll never solve these problems. Excellent, okay. Oh dear, <laughs> so many people. Um, let's have Dave. Um, and I was just wondering, in the UK, what's the difference in the size of energy available from that as opposed to freestanding turbines in strong tidal flows, which have presumably less impact? Yep. Uh, absolutely right. Uh, if, we, if we look at something like the, uh, the Seven Barrage, that was, um, oh crikey, I mean, that, that story's been around for quite a few years and uh, it's never really gone anywhere because of the impact on the environment, um, because of the sheer cost of of the uh, of the build as well, um, but also it, it's not a particularly effective way of uh, creating energy, uh, and, and 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 what that is doing is effectively blocking the tide, allowing it through a, a, a series of waterproof uh, turbines, and, and creating energy, and then when the uh, the waters flow the opposite way, it creates energy again. Tidal stream um, is. Um, uh, it, it doesn't require such large uh, civil works. We don't stop the tide at all. Uh, we allow it to, to flow past what is, well, what, what looks like underwater wind turbines, and they just stand alone, and they have very little uh, impact on, uh, on the rest of the environment in, uh, in, in the locality. For that reason, they're best placed near uh, islands, uh, in, in sounds, uh, anywhere there is a, a strong tidal flow. Um, now, as regards their uh, uh, their capacity and uh, potential, I just happen to have the right figures here. Um, tidal stream is between uh, 20 and 100 terawatt hours per year, um, and tidal barrage is uh, between 10 and 15. So it's a it's a much smaller resource. Um, however, um, you could uh, you you could get more energy from uh, tidal, uh, tidal lagoons on projects like the, um, uh, the one at Swansea, uh, where they're uh, talking about creating a, a, a lagoon between the, the two rivers there. Uh, I guess you'll remember the name of the rivers. I think it was the Towie and the Neath River, is it? Well, anyway, it's between two rivers. And, uh, and, and that's a pretty significant uh, piece of civil engineering uh, and would uh, uh, give us a an energy uh, capacity of about 320 megawatts. Compare that with the Pentland Firth, where uh, you could have uh, 200 of these rather small um, underwater turbines uh, and, and give around about the same amount of uh, energy capacity, um, and at about a tenth of the cost. Excellent. OK. This guy at the back who had his hand up before, right at the back next to Emma. Go ahead. <laughs> um, you mentioned governance on the high seas. Uh, I wondered whether that was, um, uh, I guess, actually needed, just because it seems like the high seas are self-regulating. They're so, they're so far out um, that if you're a fisherman, for instance, uh, it's very expensive to get out there, and it's very dangerous, too. If you, if you get into trouble, uh, uh, you're in a bad spot. So do we need to put resources into understanding governance on the high seas, would we be better off putting resources into understanding impacts within EEZs? Okay, so who wants to start with that one? <laughs> uh, the short answer is the high seas are very, very much fished and used. Uh, they are not off the map for many fishermen. There are huge industrial scale fishing fleets that are out there raping and pillaging those seas. So <clears throat> there's plenty of impact going on there and plenty of need for management. The manganese nodules that many countries are investing in exp 
uh, exploiting are vast and valuable, and the methods for extracting them are highly destructive. So there's much need for governance out there. I think that's probably the view of the panel, is it, in general? Mm. Let's move on then. Yep. <laughs> Thank you very much. Peter Jones from University College London. Uh, two interrelated points, and I'll come to a very quick question. The first interrelated point is about the Ocean Health Index. I think one of the great things about it is it's integrated. Now, there are issues when you open up the bonnet or open up the hood, as you'd say, in California, and go to that 200-page document and think about how these metrics were derived and the risk that people might start running towards the parameters underlying those metrics. But one of the great advantages of it is that it's integrated. The second point is something that David Agnew said, and it um, resonated very strongly with something that Rupert Howes, your chief executive, said. And the Marine Stewardship Council steps in where the state has failed. I would question, in fact, I would challenge that statement because often what the Marine Stewardship Council does is document the success that has come about as a result of state interventions. And bringing those two together now, in terms of how we improve governance to improve the prospects for marine biodiversity, um, what do the panel think is the way forward in terms of how we can combine role, the role of the state, the role of people, and the role of markets, and get away from this competitive tunnel vision view where the private sector says it's stepped in where the state has failed? Because often it's a combination of the three approaches. So what is the way forward for improving governance? Thank you. Okay, so this is our last question because we've got to get into the drinking. <coughs> so I'm going to give everyone on the panel one sentence each to improve governance um, and bring everyone together. Starting with David, you can you can have an extra sentence to respond to his point about the Marine Stewardship Council. My my reference was that why we need it at all, um, and that is because if we just let governments do it, they have proven not to be um, have a check and balance. But it's true that. Um, the most successful fisheries that we have in the program are ones where we have a three-way relationship that has been developed between government, between industry, and between private sector NGOs. And those are the most successful cooperative um, activities. Fostering those relationships, I think, will probably be the long-term legacy um, of the Marine Stewardship Council, way beyond the actual change that happens. And um, so I'm not quite sure whether that answers the governance, but I really do think that if we rely on any one actor to create that governance structure, um, it's likely to become unbalanced. So I, I would say that it has to, it, it does become a very much a cooperative win-win-win situation is, is often what people describe it. Uh, with respect to marine energy, I think that we already have good um, uh, co collaboration between uh, governments, uh, between NGOs, and uh, private industry. Um, that's not to say that it couldn't be uh, better, uh, but generally speaking, because the industry is in, in infancy, uh, it's well supported by government. Um, as regards um, uh, legislation and regulation um, of the industry, as it expands, then I think that's more of an issue and it hasn't been really uh, properly addressed just yet. That's a quick one. Uh, yeah, Peter, uh, that, that's a very good question. Uh, I think our IID's approach, I'm sure you know this very well, uh, is to bring all these different players, you know, the, 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 let's say in this case, the fishers, the consumers, or even the policymakers, the government that is, or the state, and the private sector together to work uh, together. Uh, we do create that platform and I don't personally believe that there's such thing as a perfectly or good or excellent governance level. Uh, we do need to diagnose the existing level of governance in that country, and we do need to tailor and devise a mechanism that works within that local context as opposed to prescribing uh, something that is a precondition for good practice later on. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think we've got really a, a good portfolio of success stories out there of good governance and I think we just need to replicate them. Yeah, I think that um, <clears throat> private sector and companies have a, a better pulse on human behavior and market behavior than often governments do and so they can inform uh, governments on how to structure incentives to tap into that and I think there's a real opportunity for partnerships there to change the incentive structure of policy and regulations to incentivize companies and individuals to 
do more sustainable behavior. Brilliant. Okay, so I know there are lots of other questions, but the panelists are, are very keen to chat to you over a glass of wine later. So now I'd like to move on to um, Joe. So thank you very much. Well, it's my very pleasant duty to um, thank Ben and the panel for what has been an absolutely fascinating event. I'm not a biologist. I don't know uh, much at all about fish, but I've learned an awful lot by listening today. And I think of some um, general things about climate change can be sort of extended from the discussion that we've had here. I think Ben's done a very good job of atoning for his ancestors' sins. <laughs> um, the um, ocean... Um, health index seems to me, and of course I'm sure there's all sorts of complicated things that go on in, in defining it, but it's a lovely clear sort of metric in understanding what's going on in this particular part of the climate system, how, how we can monitor what's happening and how we can see the effects of mitigation, and I'm sure there's other areas where that sort of approach might be, might be very useful. And also why we should care about climate change, of course, and, and do things about it more generally. Another theme that was running through the meeting was this... Um, um, offer of optimism, looking for optimism. Now, I might not go quite so far in, in being <coughs> optimistic about climate change in general, but I do think we need to look at the positives or what can be gained and the opportunities. <laughs> and something like the marine energy, which is going to give us the, the green energy um, with no carbon, is something that I think is really positive. And what we need is the economic model that is going to encourage investors and other people to put... Uh, into uh, new products where these were going to help to reduce um, climate change. Overall, the, the discussions about um, coordinated activities, I thought some of the things, all the way along the panel, talking about coordinated activities, it was quite inspirational. And things can be done if people, governments, organisations, etc., put their minds to it. And I, as I say, I found that completely inspirational. And I'd like to thank the panel and Ben and EJ for a very interesting event. Thank you very much.